There's a burning desire deep from within to delight in the Lord with all that I am. There's a flame of passion burning from the depths of my soul to find the Father's heartbeat wherever I would go. Well, doctrine of man. We're moving right along. We've been talking about, uh, last week we talked about the soul, right? That, that there's this immaterial part to mankind that we have, uh, whether you call it the soul or the spirit, the mind, whatever you call it, consciousness, that there's something that's not our physical body. The Bible is very clear that there is a dual, a, a dual a duality. There we go. Uh, easy for me to say. A duality to mankind that we have this immaterial nature, this immaterial self that uh, cannot be explained by physical means. The brain is not the mind. It's actually impossible for the material function of an organ to produce consciousness and rationality and will and emotion and all that. And so uh, we have this immaterial part. Um, I want to talk briefly tonight. What we're going to get into is uh, man as sinner, our fall from grace. But before we jump into that, I want to say briefly, just just to make you aware of uh, kind of the ideas that are out there about how does the soul originate, right? Well, where does it come from? We we know that we have a body and we know we have a soul. Um, we know where the body comes from, right? Uh, I, I hope so. Maybe whenever you were younger, someone explained that one to you. So we know where the body comes from. Where does the soul come from? And so there's basically four views, uh, and, and they all kind of have some liabilities, and they all have some ways they answer questions and some ways that we could go, well, but what about? Uh, but just to lay them out there, here's what people tend to think. There's what's called emergence. Uh, this would be what physicalists, what materialists, you know, they, they don't believe that there's actually a, an immaterial substance that is the soul. Um, they believe that the mind just kind of, uh, the soul is produced from the body, that it emerges, kind of the whole complex system of brain and biology that we have, that it just kind of naturally emerges. The idea of emergence is whenever you hit, you know, uh, something is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, like uh, if you take water, for instance, right? Hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is not wet. Oxygen is not wet. You put them together, you have a substance that is wet, right? And so that's emergent properties. And people say, well, that's what the mind is. But as we saw last week, we talked about some that doesn't actually work, uh, that your physical parts could give rise to your non-physical parts. There's what's called pre-existence, that, that we all existed as souls or spirits or whatever have you, um, way back for, forever before God ever created the world. And so there's just like souls in heaven waiting to be born. And whenever um, this idea is that whenever a baby is conceived at some point in there, whenever that life begins, God takes one of those souls already existing and sticks us into a body. Um, and so that one uh, doesn't really seem to have any biblical backing. Like there's nothing in there that really leads us to believe. From all points in the Bible, it points out that everything that was made was made at the beginning. That there was no pre-existent. The only thing pre-existent was God. Uh, so that one kind of has that liability. There's what's called creationism, that God just creates a soul and sticks it in the body, right? And so you're you're, you're born uh, or whenever you're conceived, that God you know creates a soul, in souls the body. And that, that's how we're made. And that's actually the most common, the most widely accepted view. The only thing that I see with that one that I go, well, how does this work, is um, our sinfulness, right? We inherit our sinfulness. Well, if that's the case, then where did our sinfulness come from? That, that would mean that if we have a sinful heart, if we by spiritually are separate from God and have this sinful condition in us, spiritually, that means that God made us sinful and then, you know, put us in our body. Um, unless there's something going on there I'm not seeing. That is a big liability to me, but maybe I'm just not understanding how that works. Um, the fourth view is called traducianism. It's, I, don't, I don't know if that's named after the person who thought it up or whatever. 
this is the idea that the soul kind of develops the same way the body does. You know, in, in the body, you have the uh, genetic material from the man and the genetic material from the woman. They come together and they grow and form a body. Well, this view is basically that there's some kind of spiritual parallel where uh, something about that joining together, the Bible says that two become one, and in that joining together, the souls kind of do the same thing the bodies do, and they contribute to a new substance, a new soul that then develops just the same way the body develops. That's a real rough basic idea. There's a lot more detail doctrine to it and some different variations, but that's basically it, that our souls develop the same way our bodies do from our parents that we get some kind of material from them or immaterial substance from them that then forms into who we are. That would explain why you have, and why in some families, musical talent just seems to really run. Um, some of the great composers and musicians, if you actually look at their family, they weren't the only one. Their families were just masterful musicians. Um, athletic ability, right? There, there's a bunch of that that's learned, but there's some of it that you just have it. And some, families just kind of have it. Um, and, and so there, there's things like that that kind of seem to be passed on, but they're not physical. So how does that work? And so there's that uh, there as well. Um, which one is the right one? I have no idea. I kind of lean towards the Traducian uh, model. Uh, just that kind of seems to make a lot more sense for me. It doesn't have the baggage of uh, where does our sinfulness come from. It explains our inheriting um, that from uh, Adam. Uh, so that kind of is why I lean that way. However, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that uh, we don't know. It, it straight out says um, regarding the immaterial part of man that we don't know how it was formed, that it's a mystery of God. So all of this is pure conjecture. We can't know. We don't really know. Maybe one day we find out, you know, in heaven. But as it stands, we don't know. Um, but that is kind of those ideas that are floating out there. Any thoughts or questions on any of that? Which, which one was it? Did you know, um, the it? No, where, where it's kind of, um, kind of it, where it uh, develops the same way the body does. That, that, that um, there, there's something spiritual going on the same way there's something physical going on. Something from the mother and father come and develop your soul the same way it develops your body. Um, now, the only issue people really have with that one is um, that means that uh, God um, wouldn't know who's going to be born and when, you know, because... That that, that, that that specific individual coming about would be dependent upon all the right people and all the right genealogy and all the right hereditary coming together to, you know, have the right family tree in order for this person to be born. Um, and so some people view that as messing with the sovereignty and uh, omniscience of God. Personally, I think he's got it. He can work it out. But um, so, all right. Man as sinner, our fall from grace our go-to passages for that, there's three of them. The first one, um, I'll just read these to you. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7. Probably well-known verses to us. Uh, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but not the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes and desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and she ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And so that, that's kind of the, the, the event where um, before that, everything was all hunky-dory, and everything was in line with God. And then we said, hmm, let's disobey. And that's where the fall happened. Um, Paul 
refers to this in Romans 5. This is kind of the, New Te- the, the main New Testament passage to do with the fall. Uh, Romans 5, 12 through 21. He says, Therefore, just as one man, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgressions of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace, the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is a complex, convoluted, um, rambling, um, I hate to say rambling, uh, you know, sorry, Lord, I know it's the word of God, but um, I mean, it's a tangled mess to kind of unweave and go, what did he just say? What is he talking about? But the kind of the main point is he's saying, hey, Sin came through one man, Adam, there's the fall. And it's going to be made right through Christ, and he's paralleling the two, as we'll see here in a little bit. But that's the whole point, is he's pointing back and saying, hey, that thing that Adam did, that's where death and sin came into the picture, was with Adam. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 says, For since by man came death, By man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And so there we have uh, these three main passages that they they point to, this idea. There was a time in the beginning where everything was perfect with God. And then there came a time, something happened, and we fell from grace, and now there is sin and death in the world, and it's because of us. That's the, the, the main just, just in a nutshell, doctrine of the fall is that God made it perfect. We messed it up. Any questions on those passages? Any thoughts there? Okay. So our original state before the fall came along, it's what uh, theologians refer to as the state of integrity. We, we had the integrity. We, we, we were as we were meant to. To be. God made us and designed us this way, and this is how we were and how we operated. And we possessed what's called a set of perfections. Uh, theologians tend to split those into two. Um, the major perfections have to do with the soul, and the minor perfections have to do with the body. Uh, we had uh, knowledge of God. We, we, we knew God. Adam and Eve knew God, walked in the garden with God. Their knowledge of who he was was perfect and complete. Uh, They had sanctity of the will. That that means that they actually uh, wanted to do what they should. Their will, their desire, their motive, their goal, their focus, their drive was all in the direction that it was supposed to be. They wanted what they were supposed to want, and they sought to do the things they were supposed to seek to do. And they had a purity and a harmony of man's desires. There was no cross uh, counterworking between Adam's desires and Eve's desires. It all worked together in harmony to want the same things. And so there wasn't this cross-working purposes against one another that we have in life today. The minor perfections regarding the body, there was immort- immortality, uh, freedom from harm. 
and um, being the Lord of the earth, our dominion over the world, that, that we, I mean, as creatures on the world, we're given dominion and commanded to subdue, and we, of course, handed that off to Satan and let him be in control. One thing that's always interesting, this is a little side note, I've always wondered, right? because there's this idea of no harm, right? That, that prior to the fall, there was no suffering. In heaven, there will be no suffering, no pain. It says that he'll wipe away every tear. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more sorrow. There will be more, no more death. I've always wondered, where is the dividing line of what is suffering and what is not? Could Adam stub his toe? Wouldn't it? I mean, he was just walking through the garden, naming animals, and it hits a root. Boom, ow, oh, you know, I, I mean, couldn't he do that? Or, 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 or maybe in his just, you know, awesome self that he was, he he just walked right and never stubbed his toe or something. I just, you know, walking along with Eve, you know, get, uh, gazing longingly into her eyes and doesn't see the tree branch. Boom, ow, ow, right? But could those things, yeah, you, you know, I'm like, would those things not happen? I mean, that, that would cause pain. They would be hurt. So, so this not able to have harm, I, I think it goes deeper than just kind of the general physical bumps and bruises, you know, just as you go through life sort of harm. I think it goes to a deeper idea of suffering of, uh, that has that psychological component of uh, anguish and, you know, turmoil. Um, and big one, this is, this is the big one, Prior to the fall, man had the ability to not sin. The uh, Latin phrase that's used is passe non peccare, means able not to sin. So, so Adam and Eve would actually go through their day not sinning. Right? Well, I mean, now, eventually they did, but prior to that, there was no sin. Right? I, how many of us can get out of bed without sinning? Right, and if I'm if I manage to make it out of bed, I'm not making it out of the house. Right, we it, it's impossible. It's going to happen. We 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 cannot not sin. But then they were able to not sin, had the ability to resist temptation and to do righteousness. They had uh, passions in harmony with their will. Right? How many of us, we want to do the right thing? We know, I want to do that, but this looks so attractive, right? Adam and Eve didn't have that. Their desires, their passions were in line with their will. They wanted the same things that they you know, wanted, their desires, their passions. Uh, and they had integrity. Their, their will wanted the right things. However, that's not our experience. We uh, are fallen. We live in what's called the state of corruption. They have the state of integrity. We're in a state of corruption. The Latin phrase, there is um, non passe non peccari, not able to not sin. We, we, we can't not sin, right? We're going to. Um, we are in contradiction to what we were created to be. All of these perfections that we had, um, right, right. Our knowledge of God, sanctity of the will, purity of harmony of our desires, the immortality, right, freedom from harm. All this got lost. It just went out the window with the fall. We broke the world, and that is kind of the result of that. And we lose our ability to not sin. We're still free, right? We can make choices. We can choose what we're going to do, but we choose to sin. We we, we might have uh, different options of sin that we choose from, but we're going to choose to sin. The Bible actually says that even man's righteous deeds are like a filthy rag. That is a nice euphemism for feminine hygiene products. Like the actual word in the Hebrew where it says that, that's what it means. And so even our good deeds are so tainted with our selfishness and our pride that even our good deeds are like a filthy rag before God. And so um, we, we lack the ability to not sin. Um, any thoughts, questions, anything on that before we jump into the next part about where all this comes from? Kind of the two main views of that. Right? This is kind of matching up with your experience. 
I, I was reading something today uh, so where some guy said that, you know, and I've encountered this uh, before people are like that's just horrible why would you tell people that they're all sinners and they can't do anything right that's just a horrible message why would you tell people that i hope you don't teach your kids that that's child abuse right and i'm like well, if that's the reality of life you better be telling it if that's the reality of the world we live in that better be your message because to say something else would be wrong and we look around, and I, I don't understand people who say that uh, man is basically good, right? That we, we don't, um, that, you know, yeah, we make mistakes, but, you know, we're, we're, we're basically good people. I'm like, do you have children? Because my children did not have to be taught how to be bad. Okay, for, from before they could even roll over on their own or chew solid food, they were angry, selfish, demanding little things, right? That was not taught to them. It came natural. Uh, uh, Vody Bauckham, a uh, preacher, I like the way he said it. He says, that is not a little angel. It's a viper in a diaper, <laughs> right? It, it, I mean, because we have this bent in us and it, it floors me because if there is any one thing in Christianity that more than anything else can be pointed to as a fact we can observe it we can demonstrate it we know it's true it's that mankind is sinful right, right? You, you you can't really argue against some people try but you can't really argue against that one so where does this sinfulness come from um, there are basically two views on this the traditional view is as we've already said comes from adam adam and eve in the garden ate the fruit disobeyed god kind of broke mankind and we inherit that brokenness it's this idea of a literal adam uh, as the head of mankind who falls into disobedience and then it gets passed on now the more modern view is um, that the fall is symbolic that that story in genesis it, it, it's a myth it didn't really happen or maybe something happened but it wasn't exactly like that um, but it just kind of lets us know. It's like a fable or a story that just kind of tells us that, hey, all of mankind is sinful. But they don't believe that there's an actual event with an actual Adam and Eve where that is what literally took place. Um, surprise, surprise, I'm a traditionalist, right? I, I take the traditional view that Genesis is a historical narrative and Adam and Eve are very real people. Um, and there was a very real event where they disobeyed, they broke mankind basically, and all the descendants from them inherit that, and that's why we are sinful. Um, kind of a few reasons, four reasons why to believe that Adam and Eve, this, this, this story, was an actual event that happened. Uh, one, there is no break in the story, in the narrative between Adam and the other figures in the story that no one argues uh, are myth. Um, the, the ones that are indisputably historical stories. So Abraham, or Joseph, or Joshua, or Moses, right? No one argues those people never existed. They believe they're historical, you know, even if they doubt the story is accurate. Even if they doubt parts of it, they go, well, okay, something happened with these people and they did things. Um, there, there is no break in the chain between Adam and Abraham. The, the, the story gives you from father to son, 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 all the way, all the way through, going all the way back to Adam. Well, you don't actually have a literal genealogy from a non-literal person, right? You, you can't have a real family line from a fictional person. So... That tells me that the Bible does not intend for Adam to be a symbol. It's referring to him as a very real person. Um, likewise, along that same line, Adam is included in the genealogies uh, that tell of the descent of these persons. Right. So, so whenever you go to, um, I believe it's in First Chronicles, there's a genealogy. right? Or, or in Genesis, where it gives the genealogy. It goes from Adam. Beget so and so, beget so and so, beget so and so, beget so and so, back to the real person. Um, Paul treats Adam as an historical figure in a number of different places. 
some of which we already read. Uh, in Acts 17, Paul says that from one man, he, uh, God, from one man, God made every nation of men to inhabit the face of the whole earth and determine the exact times and places that they should live. And so all the nations of all the people came from how many men? One. Adam. Right? So there's Paul pointing to Adam as a historical figure. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And so here he's kind of contrasting Jesus and Adam. And we'll see that he does this quite a bit over and over. In Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 2, Paul writes, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And then he says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. The point being, he's pointing to real people. He's pointing to actual events, a very real person. Um, and you have more and more parallels between uh, Jesus and Adam, right? That whole big passage there, Romans 5, we, we read. Through one man, Adam, sin came. Through the second Adam, Jesus, sin is overcome. And it's just over and over again. He's saying, Adam was the first, Jesus is the last. Adam brought the sin, Jesus brings the life. Adam brought the death, right? And just this parallel. So he's paralleling and contrasting Jesus against a fictional character. That doesn't make any sense because Jesus isn't a fictional character. We don't believe that what Jesus accomplishes is symbolic and fictional. So everything about Jesus is meant to be taken literal, but it's being paralleled to a myth. That, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and likewise, Adam is even mentioned in the New Testament in the genealogies of Christ. I mean, so um, there is no mistaking. I, you have to do some twisting and some bring in some ideas from outside of the text in order to think that Adam was not a real person. And so I think the Bible is pretty clear that Adam was a real person and this fall really did happen. Um, now on this traditional view then, right, right, where, where does the sin come from? Well, what causes the sin? Um, it's believed to be through creaturely freedom, right? Creatures have freedom. We have the ability to choose and we choose to sin. But whether some take the view that it's Satan chose, and so Satan fell, which inevitably led to him tempting mankind, and so mankind fell. Or some people view that it was um, Adam and Eve's own freedom that they chose to sin. Um, and so however it gets viewed, ultimately it comes down to freedom. Someone, and I think it's us, had you know whether it originated with satan or adam we know daily we have the choice and we choose to sin and so <clears throat> um an interesting kind of thought there is freedom right that, that were adam and eve free to sin because they didn't sin so were they free to sin well obviously they were they eventually did um so they had the freedom to not sin we're free in a narrowed sense because we're free to choose our sin, uh, but we're going to sin. And so, uh, but that freedom, we're given the ability to choose and we choose against God. Uh, the modern view, as I said, it views Genesis and the creation account and the, the account of the fall as symbolic, uh, that it is a myth. It's kind of a symbolic telling of the condition of mankind. Um, it's just like, like a parable. You know, whenever Jesus would tell a parable, he's not telling a true story. He's just telling a story to make a point. And so people view that, that, that the fall is kind of like that. It's just a parable to show a point um, that every individual falls into sin and therefore finds ourselves in this state of corruption. There wasn't one man who sinned and then now it spreads to all of us, but we all choose to sin. Uh, and Adam is sort of this symbol, a representation of all of humanity who find ourselves guilty before God. I will say that um, Adam and Eve, that their names, that, that Adam literally is the Hebrew word for man. So in the beginning, God created Adam. 
it could be a you know proper noun a name like so many names in the bible they have a symbolic meaning to them um or some theologians is what they say they say that it means in the beginning god created man just mankind he, he just created man that it wasn't a specific person referred to even eve's name has a symbolic meaning to it that the, the mother of all mankind and so even that kind of has a symbolic reference to all of mankind to it um however for the reasons already stated i don't think that one holds water i think that if you're going to take the bible serious the only real conclusion i can see that one ought to come to is that adam and eve were real people and this event we call the fall actually happened there was a tree there was some fruit they were told not to and they did and so um any thoughts questions about any of that i think most of that is pretty basic you know if you've been to sunday school more than two or three times you've probably heard that right um so <clears throat> yep well okay the, the, <laughs> shot collars stay away stay away um okay th there's two lines of thinking on that um, um and, and this is going to get into the, those big fancy words the scholars use um the idea is um did god create the world and because there's sin therefore then jesus had to go to the cross or did God create the world with the intention, I'm going to make people to show my mercy, to show my grace, to show my goodness, that I can redeem them to myself at the cross. And that was his purpose. And so therefore, in order to accomplish that goal, he had to create people who could sin. Right. Um, the, the one where um, they say that the fall occurs and then God uh, decrees that the cross will happen in order to take care of it, that is called infralapsarianism. Infralapsarianism. Yeah, I'll remember that. Yep. that, that uh, <laughs> write that down. It's going to be on the test. Um, the other one is called supralapsarianism. That's the one that says that God's primary goal was the cross it was to show his love and his grace and his mercy well if no one ever sins how do you show grace how do you show yourself to be a just god if no one's ever sinning to need justice done how do you show yourself to be merciful if there's no one messing up that needs mercy right how do you show yourself as caring and loving to redeem lost sinners if there's no sinners to redeem and so um, that's kind of that view. Um, that, that, that's, that, that's why God did it. Well, why did God allow that to happen? Because the whole purpose was to create a people that then he would um, show himself and his glory and all of his attributes to, which he could not do if we did not have the choice to love him or not, to obey him or not. And so that's why he created that free will because people say well you know why is there sin because free will we choose to well why did he give us free will why you have a bunch of yeah because yeah. he didn't want a bunch of robots right he already had that in the angels and so um but in either case right the the actual um agent of sin is not god god didn't make sin okay god god's not on the hook for that we are because we're the ones who did it um and so but why did they sin? This is a question I often get. You know, well, why did they? Right, everything was perfect. They had perfect knowledge of God. Right, they, they had everything they could want. The world worked perfect. Everything was as God designed it. Everything was in harmony. They were naked and unashamed. Right, why would they put all that in jeopardy and go just for some fruit? Why would they do that? Well, um, and also on top of that. Um, why would they sin? If, if they didn't already have the inclination we have towards sin, why did they do it? Right? And, and if they could sin, does that mean in heaven we'll be able to sin? How does all that work out? The way I 
best figure to explain that. Adam and Eve were innocent. They didn't know good and evil. They, their wills were in line with God and in line with righteousness. They didn't want to disobey God. It was not in their desire to disobey God. They were deceived into disobeying God. In their innocence, they probably did not understand deception. Whenever Satan was laying out his con job on them, they were too naive in their innocence to know what was going on. That, that, I mean, that, that is my take that they said, oh, oh, that's what God meant. Oh, well, look at that fruit. Yeah, that actually is some good stuff. Maybe we should go have some, right? That, that they were deceived. Um, doesn't get them off the hook. Just like if you have um, a child who you've told them, okay, don't do that. And they have a friend who convinces them, oh, no, no, it, it's okay to do it, right? They, they didn't go do it maliciously out of a sense of, um, I don't care what he says or she says, I'm going to go do what I want to do, right? They were deceived into it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. And I think that's where Adam and Eve were, that in their innocence, they were naive and they got deceived into their sin. Uh, we, we don't have that problem. We can't claim um, that we we want to sin. We have our our, our we're we're broken. We want to sin. We we're not able to not sin. Uh, and then whenever we get to heaven and that is restored, where our, our our will and our heart and our desires all come back in line with God, um, we're not going to sin because one, we don't want to. So we might have the freedom to, but we don't want to. So we're not going to. And the Bible says that Satan is going to be removed, right? Satan and his angels are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So the only people who are left in heaven are people who want to do right. So we're not going to sin because we don't want to, and there's not going to be anyone around to lie to us or deceive us into sinning. So we'll still have our freedom, but in the same way that um, I'm free to do heroin, Right? If I just decided I wanted to go do some heroin, I, I could probably find a dealer somewhere in Waco. Right? I, I mean, I, I've got a little bit of money in my bank. I can go withdraw some cash and go find me someone to hook me up and go do some heroin. I have the freedom to go do that. I don't want to. There's nothing in me that says, hey, let's go shoot up some heroin. It's just not in me to want that. There's no desire in me at all to go do that. I'm not going to. I'm free to. I have all the ability. It's out there. I could get it. I could probably find it pretty easy, right? I have the means monetarily, right? I'm physically capable of getting up and going and finding a dealer. There's nothing restraining me from doing it. I just don't want to. And I think that's what heaven's going to be like. There's nothing that's going to restrain us from sinning. I just don't want to. But then also there's no deceiver. There's no enemy there to tempt us into sin. And so that's why heaven will be perfect. That's why there won't be any sin in heaven. Not because God's going to remove our will and we're just going to have to be good little robots, right? He didn't create this world just to have us robots there. To give us free will here and take it away there. We'll be free. We just won't want to do bad stuff. So. And that's kind of where Adam and Eve were, except there was a deceiver in the garden. That's what led them into their... I think God allowed Satan, the deceiver in the Garden of Eden in the first place. I think because he, he, he wanted a people who chose. For free choice. Right. Give them a choice. Yeah. There, there, there had to be a choice. <clears throat> um, I mean, you know, because okay, he puts, you know, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he says, don't eat that. They don't want to eat it. Their heart, their soul, their will, their desire, everything is in line with God. They don't want to eat it. It required something to come along and say, hey, check out that tree over there, right? To kind of give them the inkling of considering a possibility. And so um, God allowed it. To test. Yeah. And, and it, I, I think it was in his intention. I don't like that word. Um, it, it was in his plan that sin was going to happen. Uh, because once you in introduce the option, 
even if it wasn't Adam and Eve, right? How about Cain or Abel or Seth or, you know, you know who, who down the line was finally going to give in to something? Um, right? there, there would have been sin. Whenever people say, oh, well, we're being punished for what Adam did. No, we're not. Put him, put you in that place. You're doing the exact same thing he did, right? Because we have that temptation that's going to end up happening. Um, and, and I think that, again, part of that is because God created a people. The Bible says he's preparing a bride for his son. And so if there's going to be genuine love, if it's actually going to be a, a, a re relationship of glorying in his majesty and his awesomeness, there actually has to be who he is on display. And that means his love, his mercy, his justice, his grace, all these things that cannot be shown to people who never sin. And so I, I think that that was in his plan that mankind would fall. So that he would have a people to whom he can show all those attributes that you can't show to a bunch of robots, right? You can't show mercy to someone who never messed up. You can't show justice to someone who's not a criminal. So I think there's that. Any other thoughts? Say something for Q. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, if you don't write it down, you're not going to in Genesis 6 about him regretting that he made man. Yeah. And he had to know that hat was going to happen, mm -hmm. but he decided to destroy all of them anyway. Now, that... Yeah. that um, With letting the sin start at the beginning, he had to have known that at some mm -hmm. point, well, he knew what point. I think one thing there, um, one thing we have to remember is that the Hebrew language is actually very small. Um, that, that, you know, in English we have tens and tens, you know, hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of words. We got words coming out our ears. We got 20 different words to say the same thing. In Hebrew, it's actually the opposite. You'd have one word that would serve multiple duties for different meanings. Um, it's actually a very small language. And so whenever we read, it says that he repented of um, creating mankind or he regretted that he made man. It kind of makes it sound like that God was like, oh, why did I even do this? What was I thinking? You know, kind of a, um, but, but th that's not necessarily how that word needs to be understood. Uh, it, it could be understood in just a sense of just he was saddened at, I mean, he, he knew it was coming, but still the reality of it was breaking his heart. You know, to, to see his creation just that off the rails sinful. I mean, it describes that the people of Noah's day, they're, um, they're the, well, every intention of their hearts were only evil continuously. I mean, to see a people that he created to be the crowning jewel of his creation, to rule for him, to have relationship with him, to be that wicked and debased, right? Break his heart. Now, that doesn't mean that he was like, oh, I shouldn't have done this. It, I think that it's really just it saying that, like that. Yeah, right. Um, and I think a lot of that is the way we translate it into English. But I don't think that's necessarily what the original Hebrew meant. I think it just kind of carries this idea of he was grieved, right? It broke his heart to see what was going on, right? And, and there's times we know something's coming, right? Uh, you, you have a loved one who's sick, and you know the end is coming, you know the end is coming, but it doesn't make it any less sad, right? So, so he may have known it, but it still broke his heart when it happened. And so, all right. Well, they're trying to break down the door. Young, come on in. Um, let's go ahead and uh, pray and get out of here. Father God, we thank you that you loved us enough to create this world. God, I, I, I thank you for your kindness, for your grace, for your mercy. And I, I thank you that even though we are a people who make mistakes, that even though, uh, God, we disobey, that we do wrong things, that you love us, that you show your grace, and you sent Christ to forgive us. It's in his name that we thank you. Amen. There's a revolution rising in our hearts and in our souls To rise above the normal, a generation bold There's a hunger in our being 
understand what is right in purity and passion, no matter what the price, in all of me. Take me deep.